You're listening to the e-commerce merchandising show presented by SearchSpring. I am just dying to ask you so many questions because you have such incredible merchandising experience. Like I look through your resume and it's brands like Schumacher, Victoria's Secret, Tommy John. And then I get down to the bottom and I see US Air Force. That's right. And so I have to start there okay. before we jump into all of the amazing things you're going to teach us about merchandising. Sure. Um, what got you from US Air Force into merchandising? What did you bring from that career forward? Absolutely. So mine is definitely a non-traditional path and not only into retail, but also into merchandising. So going way, way back, yes, I did spend just over seven years as an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force. I got my undergrad at the United States Air Force Academy. Then when I graduated, I became an officer in the Air Force. I very, very proudly served in three different foreign countries during that time. And I had an opportunity to see the world. Going back to your question, it, it was part of the expansion of that horizon for me, seeing a bigger world out there. Sometimes sounds uh, trite to say, but it, it could not be any more true. Of course, the other probably more obvious things would be leadership, managerial skill sets, things like that. And then of course, a lot of responsibility at a very young age um, on the officers at all levels. And so I learned from that and was able to incorporate all of those skills, both the soft and the hard, so when I eventually decided to leave the military, I've always wanted to live in New York. Uh, so I packed my bags and went to NYU's Stern School of Business. Uh, I received my MBA there and then segued into fashion. And that's a story in and of itself. So did you know back then that you were destined for merchandising? Not at all. So I, I thought maybe like my father, I would be in the military as a career, you know, serve 20 plus years, retire, have a second transition, as most military retirees do, and live in a house somewhere in the middle of America. But after seeing the world, I decided that my next step, I wanted to live in a major metropolitan area. It was between New York and Boston and ultimately saw myself living in, in New York. And it was during the first year of living in New York, I met so many amazing people from all walks of life. And after I did a summer internship uh, with a management consulting firm, really just said to myself that I wanted to have some fun with my life. If I'm gonna make this big, huge change, let's go into an industry that isn't so stuffy, has a little bit of fun, but is of course a business. So a friend of mine was working for a publication and he gave me a wonderful lay of the land. But he said, and this was a common theme with other people that I was networking with, they said, where's your experience? Like, where do you, where do you prove that getting into the retail world is something that you actually wanna do? Uh, versus just like thinking it's glitz and glam. Mm -hmm. So I worked really, really hard to prove myself. And so during my second year of business school, I started a column in the school paper about business of fashion. Uh, of course, I knew nothing, but I asked to interview people. And I interviewed buyers. I interviewed a former investment banker who started his own shirting company. I interviewed a drag queen and talked about different elements of fashion and how drag was influencing pop culture. I also volunteered with New York Fashion Week, but the real nuts and bolts came when I landed an internship at Marc Jacobs in their licensing department. That ended up turning into a one-year freelance role. In licensing, you get exposure to several product categories and everything from contracts with the licensees and licensors to royalties, sales reports, all kinds of really fun things, launches of a new fragrance line, and it was a really nice eye-opener. And then I eventually got a full-time role with Victoria's Secret. My first role with them was in design operations. And I would say that role probably any more than any other, was the most instrumental in really teaching me about retail because I got to learn what it took to get product created and then produced and of course in customers' hands, so bringing it to market. It gave me a really more in-depth lay of the land of retail, the functional areas, what they were really doing, 
and learning from Victoria's Secret at that time. And at that time, I was there when Victoria's Secret, I was there for about um, six and a half years. So I was in its really at the height of, of Victoria's Secret. Uh, when yeah. you go back and look at their 10Ks uh, and their annual reports, I mean, I learned from the best when the company was at its best and you could not have asked for a better education. So that really gave me tremendous opportunities. I identified that merchandising is what I wanted to do. And I was lucky enough that the leaders at the time really believed in me and they gave me a chance to transition over to merchandising. But you obviously have a varied experience, even within retail. And so it, it must have given you such a holistic view of merchandising going into that role. Ultimately, you worked up to director of merchandising at Victoria's Secret and then moved on to Tommy John. Do you have moments, aha moments that made you realize why you love merchandising so much? Oh, I sure do. I, I sure do. I, I remember not this specific moment in time, but in general, there's the seasonal product development process, but there's also launch process. I imagine that companies like Nike and Apple and so many others also have this pipeline of launch ideas. I had the opportunity in design operations to be a fly in the wall in a support role for what is still probably my favorite meetings of all time. Uh, product mm -hmm. pipeline is what it was called. It was a masterclass is what it was in merchandising. In that meeting, I got to listen and absorb all the conversations and decision making, all that mental power that the CEO, the president, the head of stores, the head of design, the head of merchandising, everything that went into to understanding why they were going forward with some ideas, where they're dropping some ideas, the timing of them, the classification of the launches. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to help shape that aspect of an organization. And I think that gave me a leg up to help me learn how to think strategically from that sense. But I also think when you combine that experience in and of itself with the product pipeline process and series of meetings, but also that nitty gritty work in design operations, I had a fuller picture. I think that also has made me a better merchant. Again, understanding not just how to read a sales report, but all the things that it took to have that product created before. I, I love that because it gives you as a merchandiser a very strategic voice in the company. And a lot of people listening are probably merchandisers who want to be in your shoes one day. So what advice would you give them if they're earlier in their careers in a company, mm -hmm. they're advocating for merchandising as a practice, but they want to get exposure to that more varied conversation, the more strategic conversation, but they don't really know how to insert themselves at that level in the business, how would you advise them to start learning? So the first thing is be curious. I know that's one of those phrases that is often <laughs> said, but it really needs to be embraced and it needs to start to be something that is within. So an example of that would be if you're curious around a product life cycle calendar. Every company has a different term for development calendar. I mean the same thing. And so it's very easy for a junior merchant to understand the steps in that calendar and to understand what the deliverables are to achieve. However, they don't always spend the time to really understand why and what goes into it. So one of the first things I've suggested is, again, every organization is a little bit different with who is responsible for that calendar in, in putting together. It might be PD, it might be an operations role, but sit down with that person and ask, walk me through this calendar. What goes into your thought process? Why do you have to review this calendar every single season? Sit down with your cross-functional partner and do that. I think another thing that I've advised recently is the world that we're living in is a world of Zoom and Google Hangouts and so many other things. You no longer have to try to find a seat in a conference room or be a lone person on a totem pole, if you will. Ask to attend it. Be curious. You're going to understand so much more just observing as an active observer, though, of these conversations. I love that. And I think people who want to learn oftentimes hesitate because they're not sure what's crossing the line, what's stepping on toes, where what seems too aggressive or uh, too ambitious. And I think, I mean, as a leader in our company, I admire so much the people who come to me and say, I want to learn more about this. Can you help me get into meetings where I can listen? Can you introduce me to people who know a lot about this topic? because it shows that they're the type of people that are gonna come into the team 
and they're going to skyrocket because they're putting themselves in situations to just become infinitely more valuable on the team, but also that value will carry on for them over their career. Absolutely. That's a great point. And it should be encouraged, but it's up to the manager or um, a mentor to help guide. Is that the right meeting? Or maybe I understand that you're interested in attending that, but let's make sure that our other bases are covered first. So I think some degree of, of discretion or guidance needs to be applied, but for the most part, I think the assertiveness is fantastic. And what's the worst that can happen? It's no, not right now. I don't think you're ready just yet for this. But the best that could happen is like, absolutely. I've been waiting for you to say something. Yeah. yeah. And, and even in those scenarios where you might not be ready, oftentimes, or a good leader will say like, how can we work together to get you ready? Absolutely. And it opens up so much career development opportunity because you've then expressed the willingness to learn. So I want to help listeners learn from some of the things that you've navigated in your career. Most recently, you were with Tommy John. And the growth that you were able to achieve at Tommy John has just been absolutely meteoric. The company was founded in 2008. Is that correct? Can you peel back the curtain just a little bit as much as you're able to? What was going on behind the scenes as you are establishing a name for yourselves, as you're building a brand? Like, how are you tracking this growth? Mm -hmm. Tell me everything. Teach us everything. Okay. All right. (laughs) So I left Victoria's Secret to join Tommy John. And probably the main reason that I left Victoria's Secret to join Tommy John was that at the time, there was this potential that I could be part of something that was growing very rapidly and also lend a mix of both the merchandising aspect as well as the operations aspect. And in fact, I did get to achieve both of those. We opened a handful of our own stores. We got much faster. We created speed programs. But then I'm also very proud that I helped launch the women's division of business. When I joined at Tommy John, we were a men's only business, primarily known for its underwear. Um, But... um, We launched Women's about two years ago. It's been performing explosively well. It's fantastic to see that growth, that acceptance, that trust from the customer. So we're finally becoming known for more than just men's underwear. We're known for men's and women's now, and then for other product categories as well. So I look back on that very, very fondly. I want to touch on that for a second, because that is an inflection point for a lot of D2C brands. When they are growing exponentially and they have a core product, oftentimes a single core product that people absolutely love. And they identify an area or opportunity to expand and it can continue exponentially growing or it can just absolutely flop. And so I want to get some ideas from you on what you felt made that expansion so successful. And if you're advising merchandisers from other D2C brands who are at that same inflection point, what would you avoid as well in that process? Great question. So first of all, the core the core has to be strong. The organization cannot let this new emerging opportunity be a distraction. So either the company, the organization has to set itself up so that it can be dual path properly, meaning there's another small task force that comes in and helps Mm -hmm. stand this new opportunity up. Or um, people work really hard and and work long hours sometimes to get it done. You know, and it could be anywhere in between. But I would say that the core has to be strong enough in order to have that. There has to be a very clear vision for why this uh, why this new opportunity is needed, wanted, what the goal of it is, mm-hmm. how it all fits together. We had a lot of conversations before we launched Women's at the very, very high level conversations around what are we trying to do? Are we trying to become a women's brand that used to have men's, but we declared, no, we want to be known as a, as a dual gender brand for both men and for women equally. That in and of itself just sets the tone for how the creative team, the marketing team, the design team, the merchandising team all have this North Star that you then can pursue because it's, the vision is much more clear. And each of our functional area objectives are that much more clear. There has to be buy-in not just a vision, but have, people have to believe in the vision. By, by people, I mean all levels from top to bottom and side to side. All have to believe in it. They have to share this vision, not just have a series of marching orders. Because I think that is a, creates an intrinsic motivation 
for for you to get excited about what this about what you've signed up for. And again, going back to Tommy John, that I understood what Tom and Aaron's vision was. And so that was my motivation. I could see it very clearly. Yeah, you said something there that I think is key to that, which is the distinction between uh, deciding on an expansion path and being given marching orders, yeah. as opposed to be having a seat at the table, having those conversations, bringing your unique perspective as a merchandiser. For someone who might be in the same situation you were in, what are some of those initial questions they should be asking in that meeting room or today virtual meeting room <laughs> of the other yeah. strategic brains in the business in order to have merchandising's voice heard in the conversation? Absolutely. So there's so many questions that need to be yeah. asked. And this is not in any priority order necessarily, but a product positioning, right? So when you look at the existing assortment, there hopefully is an architecture to it. Hopefully every single SKU, you know why, whether you're looking, whether you're responsible for a subset of a product category or uh, an entire division of business or whatever, you need as a merchant, need to understand what each SKU is responsible in achieving for top line sales how it all contributes to margin as well. And especially when there's something new, you have to then understand or create the understanding of how this new slice of this pie is going to wedge in to an existing pie that already adds up to 100%. And so that is one of the main elements of a, of a product merchant. And then for an e-com merchant, you have to then think about the experience and how does it all fit together? Whether it's the area within the, the, or the level within the funnel of that overall customer experience, the hierarchy from a sequencing perspective, how, are you going to, how is the customer gonna to navigate to this new product? How do you get credit for this new product among everything else that you're already selling? So all of that stuff has to be put together and you need to be, as a merchant, a thought partner for your other cross-functional partners to think about it and listen to what they're saying as well as having a voice and saying what you believe as well. There's gonna be push and pull, there's gonna be pushback. Sometimes there'll have to be concessions, but as long as everybody is marching towards that same vision, that same North Star, then there's no wrong or right answer. You're marching towards that same goal. Sometimes you approach it differently, but it's still the same goal. Yeah, and that's reflective of what I hear from a lot of merchandisers, but also takes it to another level, which is some merchandisers will say, before I came on, the company thought of merchandising as a luxury, or it's just like a nice to have or an add-on, or like, we, we have our store, and then maybe we'll add merchandising if we want to up conversion rate by a couple points. Mm -hmm. But the way you look at it is so foundational to even something as strategic as expansion. And I love that. So in addition to working for companies with very different uh, customer bases, mm -hmm. you've also worked in companies of varying stages in their life cycles, varying sizes. What, what from your experience are the major differences in merchandising for big brands versus smaller brands? I love that question. I think it speaks to not only the difference of the brands, but also a change in merchandising. If you look at the legends of retail, Les Wexner, Mickey Drexler, and so many other legends who've created strong merchant-led organizations or just this idea of how a merchant can add value to an organization, you know, there are some fundamental building block skill sets that they helped create create sort of like a common baseline of foundational skill set. But I think what a lot of younger slash smaller, they don't always mean the same thing, but smaller brands that in today's day and age, the merchandising function has changed um, dramatically and the needs for it have changed. No longer is it just about assembling a pretty assortment that, you know, and based off of an overall sales plan by let's call it category, by season, and you measure product performance by dollars and units according to that sales plan or TYLY comps, things like that, or channel growth, et cetera. Now you have to look at still that, but so many layers underneath that. 
You have to look at new versus repeat in terms of new to brand versus repeat purchase behavior. You have to look at if you're multi-gender, then you have to look at men versus women, both from the product hierarchy, but also the consumer. And there's a lot of resources out there that help companies decipher whether a consumer is various demographics, not just gender. And I think it's incumbent upon the merchant to dive in and not just rely on their marketing partners to look at that or BI or business intelligence partners to look at that data. You have to understand what's attracting these customers to the brand and what is it going to take to get them to come back. So you bring up data or access to data uh, Mm -hmm. as one of the major things that has changed in merchandising over the years. The degree to which brands are taking advantage of that obviously varies. What are some of the other things that you've seen change in the profession over the years? And especially now in a very pandemic associated world, I don't want to say post pandemic, but what's changing over this time? Well, regardless of, of pandemics and such, I think anybody, regardless of the functional area, and especially merchandising, has to look at data as your friend. Data is something that is good. There's a common phrase of analysis paralysis. And sometimes that's a fallacy. Like, yes, sometimes you can overthink something. You know, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to run 15 different slices in order to not make a decision. That's analysis paralysis when, when you're like, oh, I'm pretty sure I know what to do. But what I mean is that there's always more that you can try to understand. And it's not analysis paralysis if it is done with the goal of continuing to understand different facets of something, whether it's the customer or the product or something or a new potential white space opportunity. It can also be an enemy. And sometimes I've seen data used and manipulated. And data needs to be just a truth. The numbers should not lie, but they shouldn't be used to create a storyline. The storyline is the data. Yeah, I love that you talk about analysis paralysis when it comes to data being your friend. Oftentimes people will do what you just said, which is take the data, but first create a narrative and then retrofit the data (laughs) to that narrative. Or by contrast, they will have zero goal at all and they just stare at all of the data. And then you get analysis paralysis because you don't really know what goal you're working toward in in analyzing that data. You know, digging deeper doesn't always mean that it's analysis paralysis. It's like, yeah, actually this men's product here, men's product A was 90% bought by what we think are female customers. So that tells me that it's potentially a gifted item. For next year, do I do something similar? Do I buy that times X, like what's your growth factor? And then not only from a product and an inventory and planning perspective, but how do you partner with your creative and marketing partners and your e-com partners to make sure that the the funnel, that experience for the female gifter serves up that same or updated product so that we can achieve those additional plans? How do we make sure that this is in front of that particular audience? And it takes that cross-pollination of of ideation and curiosity to to do that so it's not it's definitely not as simple anymore as just saying this is the assortment go sell it i want to talk a little bit now looking forward because with your move to schumacher what are you taking with you as you transition from what up to now has been a very successful career in luxury garments to now going into luxury interiors. Mm -hmm. What are you most looking forward to? What are you bringing with you? How are you thinking about this transition? So Schumacher is a brand that's been around for over 130 years. So there's this tremendous heritage to it. But one of the things that really attracted me to join the team was everybody who's there has a tremendous amount of, everybody that I've talked to anyway, has a tremendous amount of passion for the, for the brand, um, for the product. And they all know that there's this brand with this very rich history that they're now a part of. And it's about taking that brand, continuing, uh, continuing it along its pathway into the future. Schumacher understands its core customer, So similar to what attracted me to Tommy John around, they're also interested in growth and looking at the merchandising role to help with that growth. Hopefully (laughs) what I'll do is help define how merchandising can fit into the organization and achieve 
both functional goals, but more importantly, the company and brand level goals. What are some of the first things that you're going to do getting into this new role? One, to understand the business, but two, to start to put some structure around the merchandising function. So it's important to go in first, listen, build the rapport and the relationships, build an understanding of what is currently going on. And then while you're doing that, listen, take notes, again, be curious about what are the opportunities that are truly there. Combine that with the job description, <laughs> what on paper was defining this job, and also then tweezing out from your cross-functional partners or the people that you're onboarding with, what are their needs? How do they see merchandising fitting in? It may not always marry up to what's written on paper in the job description, but I think it's our job to work hard to, to do both. And you know, with prioritization, of course, um, you can't boil the ocean in a day, so don't try. Just create a plan, and that's what I plan to do, is listen first and create a, a game plan over time. Yeah, you're making a change across industries. Yeah. In some ways, there are a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of merchandisers right now who are looking for their next role. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to those merchandisers who do want to make a jump to a new industry as they're uh, embarking on their job search? The first question I would ask if somebody was a mentee for, for me or anybody who's listening is why? Why are you interested in changing the sector within retail? It could be because they just want some diversity of experience. It could be because there were uncontrollable circumstances that are limiting that person's growth or what they think is limiting that. So many other variables that could be affecting a decision. But first ask why. Don't act too rashly, of course. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what I've seen is for more junior merchants is a very ambitious, hungry desire for a career advancement, which is good, but it also needs to be tempered with one reality, mm -hmm. <laughs> but also understanding, well, you may think you deserve a next step, but tell me how you've earned it. Tell me how you're already performing at that level. You know, some folks believe that jumping ship is a next step just because they can get that role, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be ready for it or will do as good of a job as they possibly could if they had just a little bit more experience here and there. So I would just ask, why are you interested in doing this? How does it fit in building your foundational skill set? What value will you be able to truly bring given your experience thus far? And, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Um, the worst that could happen is you take a new position, you go in and you're like, oh, actually, I didn't really like this space. And I, I want to go back to the other thing. Uh, hopefully yeah. you don't burn any bridges and, you know, you can go from there. I want to ask you one last question before we finish up. And I'm going to bring it back to the data point to rule them all for, for many merchandisers, which is a conversion rate. So for merchandisers listening who are uh, obsessing over conversion rates and pulling up their dashboards every five minutes <laughs> and watching the numbers, Let's bring it back to basics. Imagine that you're that single merchandiser in a company. What advice do you have for that merchandiser? What's the first thing you should be looking at uh, if you want to move that needle? Do you have inventory? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, Check. You know, I mean, there are so many variables that affect, affect conversion rates. Going back to one of the common themes of our conversation is getting that more holistic picture. Sometimes it's very easy for us to just think about our elements, our variables within that um, transaction in the consideration uh, to purchase something. It's not always about what the default image is for a product tile or the, the sequencing of the product tiles within a product landing page. There are things much higher in the funnel that can affect conversion. There are things at the end of the funnel, at the basket level, but in order to understand conversion, one of any function, and especially merchandising, has to think about the entire funnel and what's going on in that funnel. So conversion may drop as an example because creative or marketing changed an asset and it has nothing to do with inventory levels, but conversion could drop because you might be selling through something so fast that you're sold out of your core sizes. So understanding the full picture, 
being curious to understand the full picture and being open to things that bust your own paradigms. Be open to all of that. Don't get so hung up on your own goals because again, it's a team effort. It's a total team effort to achieve top line sales and everything uh, that comes with that. Charles, I love that. I appreciate you sharing all of your wisdom with us today. You have given us so much to think about. Your holistic view, your strategic mindset. Obviously, you put a lot of weight behind being a great teammate, being a great mentor. But if people want to continue following your career or connect with you in some way, how can they do that? Well, the easiest way from a career perspective is on LinkedIn. So definitely happy to connect with people on LinkedIn. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Absolutely, Joanne. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much.